One of the major uh, prophecies connected with the second coming of the Lord is apostasy. Are you aware of that? One of the biggest signs that you can look for uh, as, as to know when God's going to be back is when there will be this time when there will be a great falling away from the faith. And that's a, a, a strong uh, prophecy. I want to read it to you. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, it says, let, let no one in any, way, in any way deceive you, for it, Jesus' return, will not come unless the, the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. In other words, and it's called, and when in 2 Thessalonians there, when Peter, when Paul wrote that, he called it the apostasy. In other words, it's not an apostrophe or a apostrophe. It is the, it is a prophesied uh, prophecy of extreme magnitude. It was a it will be a time when this world will have turned its back upon the Lord, upon God, and and, and it will have walked away. I think at this time, what he's talking about, there will be a time of unusual events that have happened in the earth and even much more so than even today. Well, Jude walks us through what it means to be an apostate. By the way, Jude, if you look at it in the in the Hebrew and read his name, his name is Judas. But he, the English writers, the, the King James guys and the other Bible translators, when they translate his name into English, they just called him Jude. So we wouldn't get him confused with Judas Iscariot. But his name is Judas. Judas. And so uh, that just, I wanted to throw that in so you would know that. That won't cost you any extra, but it will be on the final test. So I want you to make sure of that. So apostasy means to fall away from the truth. So therefore, an apostate must be someone who was once uh, aware intellectually uh, and, and maybe even spiritually aware of salvation, aware of truth, aware of, of redemption. And this is because you can't walk away uh, from something you never had. So these are people who are, were, were aware of, of what God has done. Apostasy is rebellion against God because it is a rebellion against truth. They know the truth and they've turned their backs on it and said, I want no more of it. Now, most Christians today are looking for the Antichrist to come. and that's, They're looking for that for one of the great signs of the end, end times. And it wouldn't, you know, I'm, I'm just like you. I'm, well, I wonder if that could be him. And, well, is it going to be that one? Or maybe it's that one. And, and uh, so I get excited thinking about who the Antichrist might be. But the better sign that looks, that would tell us when the Lord's coming back, will be when the apostasy happens. So watch for that because that will truly let us know we're getting close. Well, because the Antichrist cannot occur uh, until the apostasy has happened in the world. It, that he comes in on the tail end of the apostasy. Now think about that for just a moment. If the Antichrist showed up whenever the church is, in, is strong and when the Holy Spirit is leading and moving in the earth, the Antichrist wouldn't be able to get any traction. He wouldn't be able to get a foothold in the earth. But when he comes out in that great apostasy, when there is that great worldwide falling away, well, he's going to walk in. To an, to an empty throne. He'll sit on the throne and rule because it'll be, we'll love for him to be there because we will be in a time of apostasy when we've turned our back upon the truth. Now, the Antichrist is a, the ultimate liar of all. I mean, he is the, he's the best. He cannot abide in the world where truth of God's Word is taught. He can't stand. See, the, the Antichrist or or, or that his, his likeness or his ill, those like him and who follow him, they can't abide in a church that teaches the Bible. They can't abide where the Word of God is preached and taught and learned, where people like you are falling in love with God's Word, with Jesus Himself, but in His Word, you're learning and growing in Him. Well, that, that keeps you uh, safer from evil as you put God and you plug that into your life. So the Antichrist... He's looking for a time when there won't be good Bible teaching any longer. He'll, be, he'll, he'll come at a time when, when things are really going the other way. Are we witnessing the apostasy today? That's a question I want to ask. I don't have an answer. I think we may be watching the beginnings of it. I think we may be seeing it, it started. I, I hope not. Now, let me tell you what apostates used to believe. They used to believe this. This is what an apostate believes, and then he changes his mind on it. I'm going to give you the very foundational truths tonight so you can hang on tightly to what these, uh, what the, 
this what we believe because you you need to know what it's like if you don't believe this number one Jesus is both God and man we believe that he is God and man he's not uh, <clears throat> just a good man he's God and man we believe that and people who believe that at one time and then turn around and walk away and say no he was just a good man well you can understand they're apostate because we believe Jesus is the Son of God uh, they, they Jesus rose from the dead physically we believe that and there'll be people that in who are today are saying, "No, he didn't rise from the grave. He just swooned. He he was he passed out on the cross, and they got him down and put him in a grave, and it was cool, and they rested, and and then pretty soon he came back too, and he just kind of fainted. Then he came back. But well, see, some people are saying that <clears throat> that is apostate teaching because he rose from the dead physically. <clears throat> some are going to say salvation is by works. It's not just by grace." You got to work hard. You got to do this. You got to do this and that, and be be this and be that. But uh, that's that is our foundational truth: is that He's Jesus is God and man. He rose from the dead physically. Salvation is by grace through faith. We believe that the gospel. Uh, we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the gospel is Jesus lived, He died, He was buried, and He rose again. That is the gospel. And when people ask it, see, a lot of people in the world don't know what the gospel is. They'll try to say, well, it's being an evangelical or it's... They'll pick out a thousand different things. But you and I know that the gospel is very thinly defined. Jesus lived. He died. He was buried. And three days later, He rose again. That is the gospel right there. And you, you've just heard it and you can repeat it. Now, there is only one God. And that's, those are the foundational things that we believe that the apostate will walk away from. An apostate world will deny and walk away from that kind of truth. <clears throat> now, as you remember, I, when we started teaching through the book of Jude, I told you that it was probably written to uh, the church of Laodicea. Remember I said that in the beginning? It was probably written to that church. And a lot, the more I read the book of Jude, I, I agree. It just is written to that final church, that church that's neither hot nor cold, and, and the, it's an, that apostate church, as it were. And I think that we need to remember that tonight because it, we're seeing apostate, the Laodicean church, I think we're watching it right now in our world. I think we're watching it in, in the larger denominations and and if you, and I don't want to just pick on people, and because if you think when I, if you think I'm talking about others because I think I'm all right and they're all wrong, you don't know me very well. I don't mean that at all. But there are some decisions being made by some of our larger denominations that are simply against God. They're against they're against the God God's word. They're against truth. They're against right and wrong, and they're making these decisions, and they seem to be making them with, uh, without any thought or any concern for how it'll work out in our world. So, I believe apostasy is coming to the earth as a sign. And when we see it coming, and, and if we live, if you, some of us live longer, and we watch this come on in and, and grow and expand, we're going to be uh, saying that's apostasy, and it has to happen first before the Lord comes back. So, what does it look like? Well, we talked about the, the, the tenets, the main things that we believe in. And, and when people are apostate, they'll turn their back on that. But let's, let's look into Jude. And, and Jude's going to give us three extremely clear teachings uh, uh, about this. And he's going to use uh, people you know about, two you've heard of, one you may have not heard of. And so we're going to talk quickly through them and, and let you see what he means. First of all, Jude's going to tell us that apostates look like blasphemers who offer a way to heaven other than by the blood of Jesus. They're going to say there is another way to get to heaven other than the blood of Jesus. And he's going to use for example to teach us that, he's going to call it Cain. He's going to say the way of Cain. Let's look at Jude 11. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. Now, who's Cain? Uh, most of you know who he is. Genesis chapter 4 will be his story where it's recorded in, in the Bible where, where Cain was... Uh, well, let me just read it to you. Genesis chapter 4. Adam made love to his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. 
In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are, you, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. All right, let me dig into that just a moment. Why would Jude pick out the story of Cain to show us an example of apostasy? Here's exactly what I think. Here's, here's, let me just lay this out. Abel was a shepherd, right? C Cain was a farmer, a rancher farmer. Now, what can I tell you? There is no difference between professions. Uh, if you're a farmer, great. If, you're, if you raise cattle or if you raise grain, no, one is not any more important than the other. We need both. If you... Uh, if you package widgets at the factory or if you uh, teach children or if you whatever you do every o o occupation is can be a blessed occupation you can be called and led into every occupation and everything you do and everywhere you go you become a minister to the people around you in, in whatever your situation or wherever you are God uses you and not one profession is better than another they're equal in God's sight so farming or ran, ran, uh, ranching or, or farming they're both equal but it, it, it goes on so Cain brought to God some of his produce as a sacrifice. We don't know what it was. Uh, you can use your own imagination. I don't know what kind of crops they grew back before the flood. I, you know, it's a, it was a different climate, a different time. The days, uh, I don't know if the days were longer, but, but the, the environment was different before the flood. And someday I'd like to get into just some of what I think the environment was like prior to the flood and, and how that there was a, a veil over the whole planet and, and carbon dioxide was higher and plants grew larger and, and the animals were larger. And, and, and anyway, we'll get, some of these days I want to get into that. It, to me, it's very interesting. So he brought to God some of the produce of his farm to sacrifice to the Lord. I don't know what. Let's pick out something. Uh, tomatoes. I don't know. Brought, let's say he brought tomatoes to the Lord. And uh, he brought them to the Lord as an offering. And he, and he offered them to the Lord as a sacrifice. Great thing. He loved God. He believed in God. He loved God. He wanted to worship. He had a lot of things going for him. All right? But for some reason, God did not accept his offering. Now, I should have used Abel's offering first because you would see Abel brought a, a lamb to the Lord and offered him blood sacrifice, offered that blood to him, and, and God accepted it and was pleased with Abel's sacrifice. But with Cain's grain or tomato offering, let's say, he was not satisfied with it and did not accept it. And Cain got angry. All right. That's a, so that's kind of the story here. Now, let's see if we can figure this out. Now, again, I want to tell you, Cain was a believer. It wasn't that he didn't believe. Don't, don't ever think that. Um, he was as much a believer as was Abel. They both came to worship God. You say, well, how do you know there were such believers? Think who's their mom and daddy. Think who their folks were. Adam and Eve. Uh, where do you think Adam and Eve lived? In the Garden of Eden. Who was their everyday acquaintance and friend? God was there with them. And He walked with them and He talked with them in the Garden of Eden. That was their parents. So they had a first-hand knowledge of who God was. They were believers. They wanted to worship. So there's, it can't be that. It can't be because of their parentage or whatever. But God accepted Abel's and He didn't accept Cain's. Why did He not accept Cain's? All right, let's dig into this a little further. I'm going to ask you to turn to the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Because we're going to have, we've got a problem here. We've got to figure this out. Why did God not accept Cain's uh, vegetable or fruit offering, fruit offering. Why did he not accept it? Okay, Hebrews 11, chapter 4. What is Hebrews 11? Somebody tell me off, right off the top of your head. It's the faith chapter. It's the, we call it the faith chapter of the Bible. 
Man, you ought to read it. Uh, if you haven't read it in a long time, you ought to, when you get on that, you ought to read it. it uh, the story of faith about who, who was faithful and why God loved it and, and, and why God blessed the people that were faithful. So in this story of, uh, of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, there's a clear explanation as to why. It's because faith, Cain did not have the, the kind of faith in the Word of God. You see, I don't know how it's not recorded. We have no understanding or expression of it. But I know in my heart, and you do too, that Cain and Abel both understood that, that it was to be a blood offer, blood sacrifice. It was because the blood was to be shed, and that, that is taught from the very first word of Genesis. Sometime I want to take the, the better sheep, and I'm going to take that first word in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, and I'm going to preach a whole sermon on the first word. Because buried in that first word is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the first word, and I'm going to show you how that's written, in the very first word in the book of the Bible is the story of, of death, burial, and redemption. Of, of, of resurrection and redemption. And so Cain knew that story. He understood it, but by his, he, he thought he, he just didn't have the faith enough to follow through with it. He failed to bring God a sacrifice that was not blood. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, eyes opened and they knew they were naked. They tried to clothe themselves with thick leaves. You've been there? Adam and Eve, they, they, their eyes came open when they sinned and they tried to cover it up. What what they, what they try to cover it up with? Fig leaves. All right? They cover themselves with vegetables. Are you with me? Flora. or uh, and, and what did God do whenever He um, super... Uh, when He overruled the vegetable for their covering, what did He do? He killed an animal. We don't know what kind, but He killed an animal. And um, he skinned it. Uh, have you anybody in here ever killed and skinned an animal? It's bloody. It's gory. You know, I, I, we're, we've moved in such a sensible... Sense of, our sensibilities are so sanitized and clean anymore in our culture. I ought to just bring a, a, a goat or a pig in here so I'm not kill it. Just for the shock value. <laughs> because we've gotten so far away from it. What blood means. It's life. And it's and it's gory and it's horrible. And we we go eat a McDonald's hamburger, we have no idea what it took to get that hamburger there. But a cow had to die. And they weren't nice about it. And then well, I don't want to go on and on. But you get the point. Now, I want you to notice in verse, uh, we're going to go to Genesis now, 3.20. God made coats of skin to clothe their bodies. It wasn't that Adam and Eve made skin, uh, fig leaves. God covered them with skin from the dead animal. Do you get where I'm going with this? The lesson was taught loud and clear. Folks, vegetables, <laughs> flora, uh, the things that we try to do with our hands do not cover our sin. You cannot make a covering for your sin. Only God can give you a covering for your sin. And Cain and Abel were very, very much aware of that. Abel brought a lamb to the Lord, or a little animal to the Lord, and sacrificed the blood and the fat thereof. In other words, he killed that little animal as a sacrifice offering to the Lord. But Cain tried to make a fig leaf. You see what I'm saying? He tried to cover his, his sin with, with the fig leaf, and that was not God's way. I'm going to just tell you something right now, folks. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Mark it down. Call me a, call me a conservative fundamentalist, uh, old-time preacher. Good. I, I own it. I'm proud to have it. But without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. You can't get to heaven by making your fig leaf covering. You've got to let Jesus cover you with the blood of the Lamb. So, we're saved by faith and not by works. We get to heaven only 
by God's way, and works do not open heaven's door. Cain acted. Cain acted if it, as if the, the, the grain offering or whatever, the tomato offering, was as good as anything else. But folks, when we move now, next our next study is going to be to the book of James. And James is going to beat this into the ground. Faith without works is dead, but grace is how we get there. But we'll talk about that more when we get there. Okay, um, I think you've got the point. Point number one. Because you're gonna, we're going to look at, uh, you're going to have to come back God's way by His sacrifice, by His blood covering. Now the second thing, that we go on the rest of that verse we start there in Jude, is that the church that prospers uh, without the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now, what are, we, what, what are we, Jason? What does apostasy look like? People that try to get into heaven by works and then a church that prospers without the leadership of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> yeah, well, let's read it. And then he says, They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. Okay. We're a little bit more familiar with Balaam than we are Korah. We're gonna we'll save Korah for last. We remember Balaam. You not too awfully long ago in Numbers chapter twenty-two, I preached through the book of uh, through Balaam and about the story of that. Uh, let me just retell it here just a little bit. Uh, retell the story. Balaam was a non-Jew. He was a an, uh, he was a seer, a mystic, a soothsayer. He had some kind of spiritual gift. He had the gift of, uh, of prophecy. He, he could uh, tell the future. He could read horoscopes and, and things. And he had a gift of being able to deal as a medium, uh, a sorcerer, as it were, into the spirit world. Now, folks, do you know that that is a real thing? You, There are real... These guys that do this, they're, they're using spiritual... Uh, understandings and entities that they don't know. I don't think they know who they're dealing with, but they, there is validity to this evil and mysticism and, and, and uh, mediumism, and witchcraft, etc. Well, Balaam was that. And uh, he was doing his ministry. He was doing his job. He was making money, telling people's fortunes or whatever. And so Balak was a king, a majestic, powerful king. And he uh, was he looked up and saw a million Jewish people getting ready to walk across his property and he knew that when that when those Jews walked through his land they drink all the water they eat all the crops uh, they would just leave a, a trail of devastation where they went through because you can imagine feeding a million people as they walk over your land so he didn't want them to come and try to oppose them <clears throat> and, and so we called for Balaam he said Balaam now th this is confusing don't get it confused with Balak Balak was the king. Balaam was the sorcerer. He called Balaam and he said, Balaam, come over here. I want you to curse him. Now, he didn't mean cuss him. Right? He said, I want you to curse him. What he meant was, I want you to stand here on the hill and I want you to say, I want you to put curses on him. You know, may your wife be plagued with runners in her hose. And, you, know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. He wants you to curse him like that. So he, he came and he started to do that and and they go, they're going to pay him a lot of money to do this. I mean, he boy, he could he could have took a year off and went on a cruise if he if he'd have got this money because he'd have been paid highly. <clears throat> so he came. He was going to curse him, but but God wouldn't let him. God said, "Don't you curse my people? Don't curse what I've blessed." And so he oh boy he said, "Wait a minute, guys, I can't do that." Well, one story the whole story goes on. They uh, he said no, and he went and he left, and then they said even more powerful representatives of the people of the king to him. And they got him back there again. And, and he went with them this time, but he tried again to do it, but he simply couldn't get it done. He was paid to curse Israel, uh, but he could not do it because God would not let him. So we see here that uh, he, he, it's called the error of Balaam. What does that mean is simply this, ministry gifts for hire. People who want to lead a church or who want to do ministry things for, for the money or for the prestige or for the power or, I don't know, for the adulation. They, they think it's wonderful to be a preacher. Anybody want to try this? You can have my job in a minute, all right? Uh, and I, I tell young preachers that often, if they ask me about the ministry, I'll say, if you can do anything else, do it. 
If you can do anything else, do it. Uh, I mean, really. If this, if this looks like an easy job, uh, try it for a while. Anybody can do my job for a week. I believe that. And maybe even two weeks. But try doing it for a lifetime. And you'll understand. It's just like every, it has its ups and downs. <clears throat> and it's, and it's, but anyway, let's don't get into that. I'm not here to whine. I love my job. Okay. I love to be your pastor. But there is a, there's this thing called the error of Balaam. Ministry gives for hire. And it, it deals with the lust for the pleasure of sin for a season. In other words, short time, you get paid short time for doing something or, or, or doing something for the wrong reason. There's the doctrine of Balaam, and uh, it's complicated, but what simply means it, in, okay, let me tell you what Balaam finally did. Balaam got a whole bunch of Moabite prostitutes and got them, and he, and he lined them up in a place where the Jews would be going by. And he in, had them entice the Jewish men to have sexual relationship with those Moabite prostitutes. And thereby, <clears throat> they defiled them up themselves. They broke God's command to not intermarry with the other people of the area. And so he got done, Balak got done what he wanted through Balaam, but not through the curse. He just enticed them. That's called the doctrine of Balaam. When, when we teach people to, to promote their, like to promote their church or promote their jobs or their careers by carnal or fleshly methods. <clears throat> now let me talk about that for just a moment. Again, I feel I want you to I don't you think I'm negative or against other churches or pastors. But folks, you and I both know there are large national churches with thousands and thousands of people who attend them and they have all the bells and the whistles that a church in our culture could demand. They have everything in the world going for them. And I don't want to be judgmental, but could it be that some of those churches entice people without the leadership of the Holy Spirit? Could people be coming to those churches for the bells and the whistles and the dog and pony shows and not coming to worship the Lord? Now, I don't want to be judgmental because I don't know their hearts, but I'm just wondering if that could be a possibility. And you think with me on that too. But the apostate church is a church that lay out a sin church. But it, it's going to do those sorts of things. Whatever it takes uh, th to do that. They're going to draw crowds. They're going to raise funds. And they're going to preach sermons that never bother any sinner in the congregation. They're going to be politically correct and never say the wrong thing. They're always going to be affirming and positive and uplifting. And they're never going to bring the truth of sin in front of their people and say, for the wages of sin is death. You, you sin, you're going to die. And they're going to, they're going to lull them into some kind of a sleep. And this is called the, the doctrine of Balaam. Or, and it's an apostate church thing that's happening <clears throat> in the apostate church. Jesus said of the Laodicean church, it's a church that feels like it has everything that it needs. It's rich. It's got beautiful buildings. It's got everything it needs. But Jesus said, the truth is, it's poor, it's naked, wretched, naked, and blind. They, have, they think they've got it, but down inside they have nothing. And that is the apostate church. So watch for that church. Watch, the, watch for the cowboy church. Don't ever let us do anything to draw people in other than by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's grow on, on the Lord's leadership. Let's grow by putting Him in the middle. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. I know the reason you come here is because of the wonderful aroma. I understand that. <laughs> and, and the building is nice, isn't it, by the way? Uh, we, we have no complaints at all about this building. We're glad to get to be here. But let's come to church for one reason. To love the Lord and to learn about the Lord and to visit and love our brothers and sisters yes. in Christ. That's, what's a church, that's what builds a church. Yes. That's the only reason... That's the only way a great church is ever built. You can build numbers, but you can't build a great church unless you love the Lord with all your heart and your neighbors yourself. And you get in God's Word and you grow. That's how you build a great church. I don't want to be a part of a big church. I want to be a part of a great church. I said when we came here to the South River, I told Billy and some, I said, we don't want to come here and just build a church. We want to start a movement. We want to, start, we want to change the world. We don't want to just build a church. And that's... 
and that you've caught on that vision, and, and thank you for that. The, the apostate church has everything it needs except the presence of the Holy Spirit. Remember the church in Laodicea, what Jesus said to that church? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Why is He standing at the door and knocking? Because He's not in it. He wants in. He says, if anybody in there, hello, anybody wakes up, will come and let me in, I'll come in and sup with Him. I told you that before. It's not a, it's not a in, invitation for the church. It's the invitation for the individual people in the church. If you wake up, I'll come in and meet with you. Okay, stay with me for one more. Let's look at one more example of apostasy. And this is maybe a new one to you. Uh, uh, it, I, I think you've heard of it, but let's go through this. And this is uh, the an apostate believes there are many ways to heaven. Let me just say it like that. An apostate church or preacher would believe that there's any a lot of ways to heaven. In other words, <clears throat> you, well, you go your way, I'll go my way, we'll all wind up in the same place. That's apostate teaching. It's heresy, all right? There, can I be honest with you? There's only one way to heaven. I don't want to be mean and and, and people accuse fundamental preachers like me of, of being narrow and mean because we say, well, you can't go to heaven just because you're good or because you're a member of a church. or you know. Oh, we say those things and, and they think we mean you've got to be like me. I don't mean that at all. I'm just telling you, the Bible says there's only one way to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what did he say then? No one, no man, no one comes unto the Father, but what? By me, through me. You can't get there through Muhammad or through Buddha or Oprah or whatever. <laughs> you can't get there that way. All right. So the apostate believes there are many ways to heaven. Let's read the last part of that verse again. We're down now to Korah. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Hmm. Korah. Uh, another man. <clears throat> he was jealous of Moses and of Aaron. He coveted the priestly duties of Aaron. The, we're back in the wilderness now. We're coming across, we're coming from Egypt to the promised land. <clears throat> and <clears throat> in number 16, if you want to read it there. Korah, uh, he said to Moses and to Aaron, he said, why are you guys so special? You, you're just like all the rest of us. You're just a man. Why do you think you have the authority and the, the responsibility or the authority to lead us? Couldn't any of us do just as good a job as, as you're doing? And, and in other words, let's, the gainsaying of Korah, Korah occurred <clears throat> when he challenged Moses because he was jealous of Aaron's priestly duties. I guess what he's asking is, and what, I'm, what this, this whole thing is asking, do we really need an interset intermediary? Do we need somebody between us and God? <clears throat> do, do I need to go through a priest through Moses or Aaron? Aren't all people priests to God? Do we really need Moses or aren't we all priests in God's? And, and so, let me transfer that and take it to the next point where it says, do we really need Jesus today? In, in today's interpretation, do we really need Jesus? That's what people are saying. Couldn't we just go by being good, sincere people? Couldn't we get to heaven if we're just, you know, good folks? And that's what I think that what they're saying today. Korah rebelled against Moses' leadership. I've not ever drugged much of this next thought before you, but there are many what we call typologies or types in the Old Testament and New that are types of Jesus. And Moses is a type of Christ. And, and uh, <clears throat> so they were saying, do we really need Jesus? Do, do we really need Moses? And, but what they're saying was, do we really need Jesus? Korah led 250 of the princes of Israel in rebellion against Moses. Great rebellion. We don't want to follow you. We don't want to follow the Lord. I'm translating. We don't want to follow the Lord. We want to do it our way. <clears throat> Can I tell you what happened to those folks? Oh my goodness. You're not going to believe what happened. 
God said to bring them all over and have them stand over in that one spot. So all 250 of them came over that one spot and the earth opened up under them and they fell alive in, down into the earth and then the earth covered them over. Oh my goodness. That ought to wake you up, right? Yeah. Don't mess with my leadership. Don't try to get to heaven <clears throat> some other way than through the blood of Jesus. Don't try to come. My friends, I'm going to close tonight. <clears throat> we'll, we'll try to wind Jude up Sunday morning. But I want you to know apostasy is coming. It's already started, but it's coming. It's going to get much worse. Now, just, just hear my word. It's going to be much, much worse in the years to come, in the years ahead. Don't get caught up in, in any form of it. You say, well, how do I, how do I stay on, on, on the right track? Believe that Jesus is, is God and man. Don't back up from that a moment. Believe that He lived, He died, He was buried, and He rose again. Never back up from that in any, in any form or, or detail or fashion. Don't be caught in it. And hold on to Jesus alone. He's the only thing that matters. He's the only thing that will get you to heaven. He and nothing else. Jesus. <clears throat> One of my stories I tell over and over again. But I'm going to tell it tonight because I, the Holy Spirit just told me to. I hadn't thought of this in years. <clears throat> Whenever we were little, I may have told it here too, by the way. Whenever I was little, my daddy would haul, we'd haul our hay in, put it in the barn. We had an upstairs barn, square bales. Daddy pulled the wagon up to the window, and it was tall, and we were, and we'd just walk into the barn, and right off from the top of the wagon, easy. He stepped over into the barn loft. And so daddy would buck the bales up, and we'd drag them back and stack them. And uh, then when it was all over, when we got the hay all in, and it was, then the, the wagon looked like it was way down there. And daddy'd stand down, and he'd say, boys, jump, I'll catch you. Jump, boys, just jump out, of the, jump out of the barn loft and I'll catch you. And so here we go. We'd bail out in Daddy's arms. We knew Daddy'd catch us. He wouldn't drop us for anything in the world. We knew we were safe. We could jump. We could have jumped out of an airplane. Daddy'd have caught us, you know. He was 10 foot tall and bulletproof, you know. So we jumped out and boy, Daddy'd catch us. It's fun, fun. And see, here's that's what heaven, that's what being saved is. Jesus said, Jump, I'll catch you. Go ahead, jump, I'll catch you. That's faith. We had faith in Daddy. And you have faith in the Lord. Jump, I'll catch you. And I I never really got peace in my salvation until this thought dawned in, on my, in my heart. If Jesus misses me, I'll go to hell. When I thought of that, I got the biggest peace I ever got in my life. I got comfort. I got joy. When I realized if Jesus drops me, I'll go to hell. But He never dropped anybody. He's not going to miss me. He said, jump, I'll catch you. I said, here I come. Here I come. And I'm not going to back up from that. I'm not going to back up from that. That's apostasy. I'm not going to back up from that. Are you going to go with me? Yes. Let's jump. You want to? Oh, yes. Let's jump into His arms. Lord.